So to tell us about this, what are we trying to accomplish with the Open Catalyst Project? Well, the Open Catalyst Project is basically addressing something that we're all concerned about, which is climate change. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to find some place where AI, we could apply it to really address like a fundamental problem in climate change. And as you might know, uh, you know, if we want to address um, the warming planet and that sort of thing, we need to use more renewable energy. But one of the problems that people aren't talking about, I think, when it comes to renewable energy is that that re renewable energy is intermittent. You know, the sun doesn't always shine. The wind doesn't always blow. So what that means is that when we're at peak demand, which is typically about 6 p.m. in the evening, is that we can't use solar then. And sometimes the wind isn't blowing. So we need to basically rely on gas and coal power plants at that point. So what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to take energy, which you know is being generated at noon or when the wind's blowing and transfer it to times when we actually need it. Now, you might think, okay, how are we gonna store renewable energy to use it, you know, to take it from peak um, produ production to peak demand? And you know, one way that you might think of doing that is through batteries. The problem is, is like batteries don't scale really well with storage. Like if we actually, if you do the math and you say, okay, what if the wind didn't blow uh, for five days and it was cloudy across the U.S.? How much energy would we need to store? Well, the amount of batteries that we need to do that with is just enormous. We I mean, there might not even be enough like lithium on the planet, you know, to create that many batteries. Uh, another way that people think of is, you know, we could pump water uphill. It's basically the opposite of, you know, hydroelectric dams. Um, the problem there is we just don't have enough mountain valleys to flood. So we need to figure out a way to store energy that actually scales like to nation size grids. And that's where the Open Catalyst Project comes in. What we wanna do is we wanna make the process of taking renewable energy and using that to create other fuels economically feasible. So an example that a lot of people use is we can take renewable energy and we can take water and we can split water into hydrogen and oxygen. You store the hydrogen. And then later you can use the hydrogen in a fuel cell to then create electricity. But there's other reactions too. You can take hydrogen from the same process. You can take CO2 out of the air, combine those two together to create methane, which is essentially natural gas, or you can do other processes to create ethanol, liquid fuels, that sort of thing, which then creates a nice like carbon neutral cycle to generate these fuels. And we already know how to store natural gas. We know how to store hydrogen. We can do that at mass scale. And this is something that um, would allow us to use renewable energy you know, much more. It allows us to kind of scale the use of solar and uh, the wind, you know, to the nation's highest grids and get rid of, you know, fossil fuels in the future. But there's one big problem, which is that to do this conversion, to use renewable energy to create these fuels, these are all chemical reactions. And we need these chemical reactions to be cheap. And what drives these chemical reactions are catalysts. And the unfortunate thing is that the catalysts that we're using right now use expensive metals like platinum, iridium, you know, things like that, uh, which are just too expensive to mass produce. So what we want to do is we want to discover new materials that are cheap, durable, and effective in these chemical reactions. Now, the problem is, is that there's billions of possible materials, maybe even trillions. There's like tons of different materials. And if you go around just testing them, basically what people are doing right now is they're just using human intuition. They're like, oh, we tried this. Let's try this idea. Let's try this idea. And if you kind of try things out experimentally, you know, you can do like 10 a day, you know, maybe a thousand or, or two a year. But if you're, you know, trying out, you know, a thousand or so per year and there's billions of possibilities, it's, you know, needle and haystack. You might not find what you're looking for. What we want to do is we want to do that search computationally. And chemists are already doing this using something called density functional theory, which basically simulates a small number of atoms. So you can have like a, a molecule that's just part of a chemical reaction. You can simulate the surface of the catalyst and you can say, okay, how do they interact? And basically DFT is going to compute the forces on these atoms to then you know, estimate how these two things are going to interact. The problem there is, is that to simulate each one of these materials, it can take days, days of compute, which essentially is just as expensive as running the experiments themselves. Now, this is where the machine learning comes in. So we can take, hopefully, those DFT calculations, which take days to compute, and if we can approximate them with machine learning, we can make them you know, 10,000 times faster. Instead of days, they can be done in seconds. If you do that, then I think for the first time, we can actually brute force the search for new catalysts computationally, which hasn't been able to be done before. Got it, got it. Okay, there, there's a lot there to unpack. And this is, this is obviously <laughs> super exciting. You know, what, so, so the obvious question is, um, you know, why now? Why, why haven't people tried this approach you know, years ago? Um, why is this the right time to, to solve this problem? It's a great question. And it's actually tied to why now and why us? 
So what happened in the chemistry community right now is that they were looking at, you know, a small number, number of molecules, a small number of, you know, materials and running machine learning models. And they were seeing some promise. Like it looked like it could potentially work. The problem was is they could never come up with models that could generalize across a big number of materials. And the reason for that was they couldn't create data sets big enough. So if you want to train a machine learning model on this, you need a really big data set. And right. as I said, mentioned before, the DFT calculations are really expensive. So even with the government supercomputers, like one of the, the external collaborators that we're working with from CMU, they generated about a 40,000 you know, material like simulation database over a period of two to three years. And that's the most wow. they could do with what they had. So this gave us a unique opportunity to come in, create the world's largest data set that then everybody can train models on, and then see if we can generalize to like a wide set of materials. And if we can do that, then we can finally create models that can then search across, you know, all sorts of different materials to find the right one. Got it. And so where are we in the phase of this project? Are we still generating the data set? Uh, have we done that? And we're trying to build them the models to simulate? What, what have we gotten done so far? Yeah. So two years ago, we basically started creating the data set. We basically ran 50,000 servers for three months. And it, come out, it came out to about 200 million hours of compute to generate this data set. Um, and this da the first data set we created was specifically for something called um, CO2RR, carbon dioxide reduction reactions, which is basically uh, how do you take carbon dioxide and, um, and hydrogen to create other fuels. So we're looking for catalysts in that space. That data set we released last year. And it is, like I said, the world's biggest data set for this type of problem that is out there. Um, and it's been used by numerous groups, you know, DeepMind, Microsoft Research. We held an, a competition at NERIPS last year um, you know, on this data set as well. So it is something that's out there, people are aware of, and they're using it. And we've been building models with it for the last you know, year or so. What's, what's the core sort of intuition for why we think machine learning can solve this particular class of problems? I think it is the only way that we can do a thorough search of the material space. We, because this is not, uh, this is not necessarily about finding a, a new way of doing things. What it's about, what it's about, is taking a way that we already know that works. You know, the computational web methods, CFT, and just making them faster. And that's something that I mean, how else? I mean, you can think of machine learning. This is, you could use the word AI, but this is really machine learning. It's really function approximation. Because we're approximating this really complex function using something that's a lot simpler and a lot easier to compute. And then once we have that, then we can do this, this brute force search. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I want to bring you back to the question you sort of answered in the very beginning, which is sort of, you know, why thinking about this problem? It's an incredibly important problem to solve, but it's not intuitive right away that this is the sort of thing Meta should go tackle. Why, you know, why at the time did you think we should go after it? And why now should we be focused on this problem? Yeah, I think there's basically three reasons. One is, you know, it's super important to the world which we already talked about. I think the second one is we hit on this, which is Meta is uniquely positioned to be able to tackle it, right? And the third one was, it's an incredibly interesting scientific problem. And then the final one, well, let's add the fourth one, is, you know, right now we look at our sustainability commitments. Like we want to be, you know, we want to be net zero. And I know we might not be committing right now to 24 seven renewable energy use, but I bet you in the future, we will want to be. And if you want to be 24 seven relying on renewable energy, you have to figure out a way to store it because renewable energy isn't always there. So, you know, this is kind of, this, this project isn't a one or two year project. This is a 10 year project, you know, that, that we want to embark on. Now, if you want, what we talked about here is one vertical, which is renewable energy storage and materials for that. But what we're working on right here is actually in many ways more generic. It can be used for other types of material discovery as well. So there's other types of materials, other problems that Meta, you know, is very interested in. So we're basically looking into those, starting those explorations right now as well. Awesome. Well, is there anything else I didn't ask about the project that you wanted to share? One thing I just want to emphasize is that material science is actually important in many different areas, uh, you know, in Meta. You know, we talked about renewable energy storage, which is kind of our hero project, but there's also direct air capture. So the materials that you use to kind of suck CO2 out of the air, kind of a similar problem in some ways. And then you also have displays. I'm not sure if you know, but OLEDs, they're crystals as well. You can model them with DFT. 
So one thing that we're looking at just the beginning stages right now is can we use similar technologies to help us develop better you know, displays for AR, VR? Lots to do here. So, well, thanks yeah. for um, uh, spearheading this project and for coming on to Shrep Tech today to tell us a little bit about it. Great. Thanks for having me.